Bridge Church, it's so good to be with you this morning. My name is Jono. And I'm Corrie and we are really pleased to have you with us today. We are. So today is the 22nd of November. Can anyone tell me what happened on this day in 2003? Or can you tell us, Corrie? It's a long time ago. <laughs> no. It was, but England beat Australia in their own backyard in the Rugby World Cup final. There we go. Cool story. Thank you. <laughs> More excitingly, it's just one week today until Advent begins. I'm so excited to get up our Christmas decorations. Surprising enough already. Uh, it's just a matter of time. We haven't had any time. <laughs> sure. Have you at home got yours up already or are you waiting for the 1st of December? I think this is one that divides people quite a lot. It does. Isn't it? My mum and dad have got their tree up already. Yeah. Can't believe it. I'm so excited. I'm just excited for festivities to begin. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, as we kick on with church this morning, we are in the last in our mini-series, The Adventure, looking at God Provides. So we've got a talk from Reverend Andy Buttress on that a bit later. We've got two interviews this morning. We have. Who's first? What a treat. First up, we have our very own Helen Smith, who is here to talk to us about what's going on in her life at the moment, and... Probably linking a little bit to last week, which was on testing. We all know that this previous few months have been quite testing, so let's find out how things have been for Helen. And just a note, we apologise in advance. The audio quality got a bit poor towards the end of the video, so it's caught shut, short slightly. But let's have a look, Helen. Well, hello, Helen. Hiya. <laughs> Thank you for joining me tonight uh, on Zoom. Um, a few questions as we go forward into this uh, little interview together. The first uh -huh. one is, what's it like being a school teacher at the moment? <laughs> um, well, I think the pandemic makes everything complicated, um, but I'm quite aware that that's the same for everybody. So every industry and every occupation has got their own complications with the whole pandemic thing at the minute. And we all just have to kind of get along with it. But um, for teachers, it means teaching without the freedom of really being able to move around the class properly. Um, so there's lots of things that teachers usually do that they they can't do or they don't feel comfortable about doing and they can't use resources in the same kind of way. Um, so it's kind of different and the children are all positioned in rows and the classrooms are cold. Um, because we've got to try and ventilate as much as we can. So it's a little bit com complicated. And then we, we have um, pockets of anxiety in various places around the community. So the, not many children, I must say, or it's not overtly obvious in, in most of the children, but certainly with some parents and some of our staff as well. So we're sort of a little bit... Mm, mm. And, and a little dicky bird tells me, well, I've known for some time, that you're not going to be a school teacher for much longer. Why no. ever not? What's going on? <laughs> well, my love for teaching has gradually eroded, um, mostly by external stuff, by what the government say or do, um, by what the, the sort of the reaction that the press give to teachers some of the times isn't always helpful or positive. That sort of constant demand for results. Um, I so say, I suppose over the last few years, I have been thinking about making my way gradually out of the door. Um, so, but it's gradually clarified over the last couple of years, I say. Two years ago, um, two years ago, come January, my mental health was suffering quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, found myself really very low um, to the point where I've never really experienced anything like that before. Um, and I went to the doctor and the doctor prescribed me some medication. Um, and then through school, I was sent to an occupational health interview. And through the wellbeing provider, I had a lot of counselling. And I think with that counselling, as a result of that, it really sort of made me realise that I wasn't really in a very healthy place or that mm. the environment wasn't a very healthy place for me to be. So um, 
I suppose that was when it really hit me that I needed to to, to have a change. Mm. So, so were there any other factors that sort of uh, came along, you know, any incentives to resign, anything sort of in the pipeline? No, no I mean, I did, um, I did talk it all through this with the school, um, talked about maybe seeing if I could reduce my hours, that kind of thing. And that, that really wasn't possible. So I knew that actually, um, what I wanted to do was to cut my hours down as I'm getting on in years, you see. So I need to have a little bit of a little bit more time to myself, time with my husband. Um, so I just really started praying for an opportunity to, to appear. Um, but there were lots of conversations I had with, with Rob about it, just trying to decide what it was exactly that I wanted, that I should um, write down all of the things that I wanted out of a job. And one of those things that I wanted from a job was to be able to work for the church. And that was the one thing that really um, sort of struck me. So, but I kept an eye open. Um, I do think that um, God uses counsellors and professionals to sort of um, guide us and instruct us in a way. I think um, I was praying really hard for an alternative to show up, but... I think the sort of the guidance that I had from from not just professionals either from people around you, people that you trust, and I got people praying to try and see which direction I might go in, um, and I think that really helped mm. me to sort of see that I needed to to change and have a real change. Yeah. And then somebody, um, a close friend, if you like, put me onto this idea that there was a job appearing. Um, for working for the Church of England in Ipswich, for inspiring Ipswich for the project, inspiring Ipswich. Um, so I just was watching out for that job really, and I looked for lot. I looked at lots of jobs, and there were every time I looked at another these other jobs, there was just they just didn't feel as though that was what I wanted to do. You know, they didn't really. They sort of I'd, I'd see this title advertised and think, oh, that looks really exciting, and, and then I'd look at and I think hmm, no not really that's not really what I want to do and then so I just was waiting for this one particularly one particular job and praying that it would come up and it would be the right one for me mm. and then when it did come up this job for at Inspire and Ipswich um it really did look as though it was written for me I clicked on it every single job that I'd had in the past was reflected in the the sort of the job specification and everything it really looked as though that was exactly what I should be doing. Um, so I went for it. Um, well done, and you got, you got the job. I got the job. You got yeah. the job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for but sharing that, Helen. Thank you for sharing yeah. that, because um, you obviously just shared something, you know, quite personal about your life. Uh, and also for saying that guidance sometimes comes through counsellors, through, through for, for professional people like that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's very important to take on board that sometimes, you know, the way we are led, um, you know, comes through through people who are you know, aware of what they're talking about, people trained, people in those kind of professions. So that, that's good. I mean, are you 100 percent sure you've done the right thing? You know, are you wobbling a bit, wavering or are, are you fairly convinced? I'm fairly convinced. I think um there were, it wasn't easy that sort of applying for that job didn't, it didn't all slot into pay, place perfectly. There were sort of ups and downs along the way. So the first time that the job was advertised was um, in sort of February, March time. And the interview date, the original interview date was set for the 2nd of April, which is probably most people realize was after lockdown. So the whole process was, mm -hmm. Um, shelved if you like halted and, and nothing happened so then I had to wait and they didn't know whether they'd still need that post after the lockdown after the initial lockdown mm -hmm. so then I had to wait for it to be re-advertised um, mm -hmm. and apply again for it mm -hmm. um, yes yeah, so it, it didn't all come sort of Mm -hmm. um, really in a straightforward way. There was quite a period when um, when 
I was, I'd had the interview and I was expecting to hear quite soon after that. I, I had it in my head that I would hear that day whether I'd been successful or not. And um, I didn't hear. And um, I sort of managed to convince myself overnight that I had to uh, and it was an indescribable feeling, really, because I was absolutely convinced that this was what God wanted me to do. Um, but I was I'd convinced myself that I hadn't got it. And I was almost crying out to God inside. Well, if not that job, then what? Because nothing else had really appealed to me at all. And I was just sort of like, ah, what am I going to do if I've not got to do this? And then um, when I did get the call to say that I'd got the job, I just was sort of really couldn't believe it. But I suppose I'm all the more grateful, I, I guess, that, that, um, mm. that, you know, yeah. that I've mm. been successful with it. But, well. So your, your faith is being just a little bit tested and tried at the moment. And as you look a bit more <laughs> long term with the changes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it is. And, and sort of almost as well, I was thinking the other day, you know, Nothing is quite certain, is it, when you're changing your job? And probably now isn't a good time to change your job anyway, because, you know, what if I was to be furloughed or what if, the, you know, I, I wouldn't have the same kind of um, protection, I guess, as I've got now with a job that's really secure and, you know, with, and but, yeah, I, I really do believe that it is the right place for me. Thanks guys. Thank you Helen for taking the time to share with us. It's been really good to hear from you this morning. It really has. So we'll be hearing from Reverend Andy Buttress in just a moment, but I want to share a story with you guys. Have you heard about the Christian man on the safari? No, I haven't. Well, he met a lion, probably not someone you want to meet, and obviously started running away. And as he was running away from this lion, he prayed to God, God, I really pray that you'll give this lion a Christian thought. Anyway, the lion catches up with this man, and as he stops, he kneels and said to God, Dear God, thank you for the loving food that you have provided for me. <laughs> the reason for that story is we are looking at oh. God provides. <laughs> Oh, that was dreadful. <laughs> and so, now we're going over to Andy to hear his talk, and you've also got an interview in there from somebody called Tom, who is a leader of a local church in Ipswich as well. So, treat, grab your cuppa, sit back, yeah. and listen in. Good morning. The first thing I'd like you to do this morning is to have in your mind two different images. The first image is that of a helicopter hovering over some dry, arid land. And on the ground are a group of people waiting. And then as the helicopter comes above this group of people, the humanitarian aid workers in the helicopter throw out these parcels, these food parcels. And suddenly the crowd disperses and charges for these food parcels. Some, some people get hold of the same one and they're pulling at it and, and fighting with it. Other people, they, they get their food parcel and, and they, they hold it and, and, and they run off with their prize. The second image I'd like to uh, put into your mind is of a supermarket aisle with people going down the aisles with their shopping trolleys. And the shelves are, to be honest, about two thirds full. Um, but people are putting loads of stuff in their shopping trolleys, toilet rolls and flour and, 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 and vegetables. And they are frantic and, and the, the shopping um, shelves are, are emptying quickly as people's uh, trolleys are, are filling up. There is this, I read an article earlier in the week by a woman called B. Wilson, who uh, works for the uh, 
Guardian. And she was uh, writing an article really that related to the early part of lockdown when she went to uh, Sainsbury's and found basically that uh, there was nothing on the shelves. And she was talking about um, how that made her feel really shaky, that she hadn't felt like this for a long, long time. And uh, she says these words, she says, what is generally called panic buying, a common human response to crisis, is not caused by food shortages per se, but by fear. At its root is a fear of scarcity. And this fear is self-fulfilling because the more people anxiously stockpile, the more others get infected by panic and the faster the food runs out. She here talks about a basic fear. And there is a basic fear, I think, in all of us when we feel a threat to our very existence, to our very survival. And it doesn't happen to us very often in the West, but at the beginning of the pandemic particularly, it seemed to happen to many people that there was a threat to our survival. There was a, a deep down basic primal fear that seemed to kick in that caused people to panic by. It was a kind of self-preservation. It, it was very self-centred and was about how much I could stockpile so that I could survive. And I guess we are all brought up, aren't we, to value um, our survival, that we need to provide for ourselves, that we need to provide for those you know, closely around us in our families. We're brought up to, to realise that that is what we need to do, because if we don't do that, then we may not survive. So providing is a crucial part to our survival. But when you look at what it means to follow Jesus, you kind of come to the conclusion that that's, that's only part of, of, of it. That when you follow Jesus, there's an aspect of life where God calls you to realise, first of all, that we're kidding ourselves if we genuinely believe that we can provide for ourselves. Doesn't he just remind us sometimes that with our health, with our very breath, we're not in control of that. That only he, the creator and sustainer of our lives, is ultimately in control of the very things that matter. The fact that we can breathe. And I think there are occasions too where either because of what life throws at us or because of what God leads us into. He wants us to get to a point where we realise that <clears throat> we can't provide for ourselves for everything and that actually Trusting in God, our Heavenly Father, and seeing him provide is the way forwards. Because there are situations where we simply cannot provide for what perhaps we need in a given situation. So let me take a, a, a couple of examples. The first one uh, comes from a lady called Corrie Ten Boom, whom some of you may have heard of. Heard of. She was a uh, a prisoner of war in Ravensbrück concentration camp because her family harboured Jews. And so she was in uh, this concentration camp in the Second World War. And she tells a story about a, a handkerchief. Now, she, she was in this prison camp and she had a cold. Now, imagine what it's like to have a streaming cold and you haven't got any paracetamol or, or nurofen. You haven't got a hot water bottle. And perhaps worst of all, you haven't got a handkerchief. Imagine having a streaming cold without tissues. Anyway, that was her situation. 
She was in this concentration camp. She had a streaming cold and she had no tissues. And she writes this. I told my sister Betsy and she said, pray for a handkerchief. I started to laugh. Betsy prayed, Father, I pray in Jesus name that you will give Corrie a handkerchief because she has a cold. Just a bit later, I heard my name being called. I went to the window and saw a friend of mine who was also a prisoner and who worked in the hospital. Here she said, take this. I'm bringing you a present. I opened the package and it was a handkerchief. How did you know that I needed a handkerchief? Did you know I had a cold? No, she said. I was just sewing handkerchiefs from an old piece of sheet and I heard a voice in my heart say, take a handkerchief to Corrie Ten Boom. A second little story is to do with me and Dawn. <laughs> and it's pretty similar, actually. We were, we were living at the time, just after we got married, in a place called Oswestry. We just moved up there uh, after, say, we got married and we were living in this flat and we basically had no furniture. So our wedding presents were just laid out on the floor. We hadn't got anything to put them in. So we, we decided to try and find um, a place called Tack Alley. And it was a place in Oswestry where they sold secondhand furniture. And we were really looking to get some kind of um, sideboard, as they called them then, or some kind of, you know, um, display unit. So so we were walking down trying to find Tack Alley. Um, and we just said to ourselves, you know, we really do need, need, need a sideboard. When a person who we hardly knew because we'd only been there two, two weeks, drove past uh, in his car on this one-way system. He couldn't stop because of the one-way system, but he opened his window and said, hey, Andrew and Dawn, do you want a sideboard? And, and drove on. And it, it was literally a couple of minutes before that that we had said, we need a sideboard. And it was, it was the, the, the timing was incredible. And we have many stories, to be honest, of the way God has provided for us. Sometimes God does call you to go into different situations, to step out of your, your, your comfort zone, you know. And, and it's at those times when you need somehow for God to provide for you, he does. Uh, a letter written to the church at Philippi by Paul says this and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God provides for people when they follow Jesus. A couple of weeks ago I met with a guy called Tom, Tom Scribbins, who is the leader of Hope Church and they have had some amazing answers to prayer as they have sought God to provide for them as they have bought the Odeon Cinema in Ipswich. And Tom, uh, I met with Tom this week and we had a short interview together. So here is the interview I had with Tom. So good morning, Tom. Thanks ever so much for, for joining us this morning. Um, just for folks who don't know anything about you, can you just, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I'm Tom, I'm married to Sarah um, and we've got three children who are uh, tw twin girls who are eight and a boy who's five. Um, we live in sort of northeast Ipswich and um, we've been in Ipswich for the last six and a half years and we're part of Hope Church in Ipswich and um, I don't know what else do you want to know but that's a little bit about me. <laughs> hobbies? Hobbies? Hobbies. I love watching and playing football. Um, I enjoy playing guitar not amazing at it but i enjoy it uh, and i'm oh, in the and background I'm, yeah my guitar's in the background yeah and yeah. uh i am a enthusiastic but also not very skillful photographer as well i like photography okay cool and what's your team football team chelsea right okay we'll and move hello. on we'll move on <laughs> hey <laughs> so you're leading hope church that's right uh, can you just describe a little bit about sort of what sort of church hope church is yeah so we are quite a diverse bunch of people um 
with, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40% of the church not from this nation, which is quite exciting. Right. Um, and uh, we are from all over the area, from as far away as Woodbridge to Capel, and then all over Ipswich as well. Um, and we've been in Ipswich for um, over 30 years. It started off as a, as a, as a church just meeting in a home, moved uh, various times, uh, several times to various locations. And uh, we're currently based at Four Hamlet, uh, opposite the Gardener's Arms pub. And um, we're the long white building where we, where we gather, um, which a lot of people don't really know is, you know, is our home. So <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit about us. Mm. So you don't plan to be there for long, I, I, I believe, because you've, you've now bought this old uh, cinema, the Odeon Cinema in Ipswich. Can yeah. you just tell us a bit about your thinking as to why, you, why you've uh, purchased that? Yeah, so we, as a, as a church, we've had a number of, um, of encouragements over the years that uh, we believe God is, is leading us to um, make a big impact here in Ipswich. We, we are praying um, that we would see many, many people come to know Jesus here in Ipswich and that we would really serve our town well. And uh, it became a growing prayer of ours a few years ago that God would, would give us a larger venue. Um, and we started to, to explore where that might be uh, back in 2016. And um, uh, long story very short, at the beginning of 2017, having investigated a few other options and having started to pray as a church and, and to give money into um, a fund that would one day um, help us to get a, a new place. Um, beginning of 2017, we were alerted to the fact that the Odeon Cinema might be available uh, to purchase and um, we investigated that. And again, long story very short, we, after praying, after getting around the building a number of times with key individuals in the church, we felt it was the right thing to go for. We felt God was in it. Um, and then back in uh, May 2018, we had planning permission granted to uh, change of use. Um, so it would become a place of worship. And we purchased back in uh, October, uh, 2018 so it's been a couple of years now that we've had it mm -hmm. um, so we feel really that it's 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 part of what God would want for us as Hope Church um, as one of many great churches in Ipswich and we feel it's it's this, the town centre location is really really um, important we can be a beacon of hope there um, there's lots of uh, people with great need that we can serve and um, and welcome in and so yeah that's that's a little bit of the heart behind it really mm. and i guess that didn't come cheap and i guess the renovation of it hasn't been cheap either um how has all that worked and, and are you seeing god provide we we are it, yeah it really it really hasn't been cheap and um we we it was a miracle that we were able to purchase it in the first instance really we'd had some um, gift days at church uh, we've been calling them journey offerings because this is part of a journey that we're on as a church and um, we, for the first few times that we had these offerings, we were having two a year. Um, we didn't reach our target for the first maybe four or five times, um, but we were still incredible. I mean, as a church, we, we gave incredibly well and we were so thrilled as, as leaders that, you know, we were able to, to raise what we raised. But uh, it took a little bit of time um, to really start to um, reach the targets that we had set. Um, but yeah, even in the purchase, it was a miracle that we got over the line with that. And then as we've kind of got to know the building more, uh, inevitably costs um, go up. And we uh, also our scope of what we wanted to do in the building has, has kind of evolved as well. And so it has meant we've had to raise hundreds of thousands of pounds in the last few years. And there are, I'm sure, wealthy people in our church, but there are a lot of people who, for whom, you know, hundred to give a hundred pounds would be a lot of money and would be really stretching mm -hmm. and so i wouldn't describe us as a wealthy church um in that regard and yet again and again as we've <clears throat> sought god in prayer as we've um we stretched ourselves and we've we've just reminded ourselves all this is actually god's anyway we get to give back to him into his kingdom purposes um we've seen some incredible things happening last september we had the, our biggest um, offering yet, and uh, we were going for a target of three hundred thousand pounds. All of our previous offerings had been one hundred thousand pounds, and 
I remember being in a leadership team meeting and saying, well, I think this is ha this has to be our target because we need to raise this money. Um, and I kind of thought afterwards, what have I done? What have I said? You know, and I remember praying a few days before our offering, God, you're going to have to turn up here. Otherwise, I'm going to look very silly. Um, and uh, and he did. And he really did. I don't think it was to to make to stop me looking silly. I think he's prepared to let me look silly. But I think uh, we, you know, we, we saw £260,000 raised in one week last year. Wow. And it was mind blowing and really, really encouraging. Um, and, and, and really, our heart is that even once this building is done and once we've, you know, paid for all that we need to pay for, we, we really want to continue to be a church which is radically generous with our, not just our service and our time, but with our finances as well, that we, we put to death the idol of money that is so, um, so big in our society that we say, look, you know, we're going to, we're going to give radically and it's going to give, we're going to give where it hurts a little bit as well. And, um, and we're going to give money away and we're going to give money to, to, to church planting and all kinds of things. So mm, it's, mm. it's something that we really are passionate about that this isn't just a bricks and mortar thing, that this is actually the start of a, a giving journey for us as a church yeah. in the long run and, and just expecting God's provision really. Mm. I'd love to do another Zoom call with you, Tom, about one or two other things as well. We haven't yeah. got too much time this morning, but just to finish, maybe one lesson that you've learned on, on, on the road, on the journey? Yeah, I, I would say uh, corporate prayer is the big thing, um, that getting together to pray. I know that at the moment that's a challenge, um, but when those restrictions are lifted and, and this you know, becomes possible to get together and pray and seek God, uh, for the town to seek God for your church um, is so important and uh, and as you pray as you take the promises of God back to him say God you said it <laughs> we're, <laughs> That's coming right. yeah. we're coming to you with these because you said it um, we're going to knock on your door and we're going to ask of you big things I would encourage you um, Bridge Church to really get a hold of God in in, in prayer um, and and I just want to say finish really by saying that you know it's so good to have you guys here in Ipswich I'm speaking with Andy recently and uh you know just saying we need 50 more churches in Ipswich we you know there's no sense in which there's there's too many churches here we we need more <laughs> and we need we need thriving churches that love Jesus and love his word and uh it's really really good to have you guys in the town and we're rooting for you we really are so go for it guys with all you got likewise Tom likewise and we just look forward to working together with you yeah and with Hope Church so so God bless you Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. All right. Yeah, bye, everyone. We'll, yeah, we'll catch up soon. Cheers, mate. ta -ra. So this morning we have heard about how God has provided for Helen in uh, giving her a, a new job and for Tom at Hope Church. And now we are coming to the end of this mini series, The Adventure, and we've looked at how God calls, how he guides, how he tests and how he provides. And I think we've seen that this is how God works. If you look at a significant character in the Old Testament called Abraham, you see this is how God works. God calls Abraham and says to Abraham, you Abraham will be the father of a great nation and you will have offspring and from your offspring will come that nation god calls he then guides abraham because he says to abraham leave your your hometown of ur to a place that i will show you and 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 god guides abraham out of his home to to egypt initially and then on to a land called canaan which in the future, for the future generations, would become their, their homeland. And then we find that God tests because Sarah, Abraham's wife, is unable to conceive any children. She is barren and, and she now is too old. And Abraham obviously asks the question, asks, obviously begins to doubt, you know, God, God said this, that I would be the father of a great nation. And yet my wife is barren. 
So these circumstances provide a huge test for Abraham. And to be honest, what happens is a huge fail. Abraham and Sarah decide on a plan, which means that Abraham sleeps with Hagar, the, the servant girl. And through that uh, relationship, there is a child born, Ishmael. Th this is forcing the issue, trying to force God's hand, trying to take it into your own hands and do it your own way. And this was a huge fail. And in many ways, Abraham failed the test. But God is gracious and God fulfilled his promise. And one day, you know, Abraham was sitting there at his at his home and three rather strange visitors turn up and say to Abraham and Sarah, within a year, Sarah will be pregnant. And Sarah laughs because she, she can't believe it. But true to that word, Sarah becomes pregnant. And we read in chapter 21 of Genesis, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. So this is how God works. He calls, he guides, he uses tests in our lives, and then he provides. And that is how he longs to work for you and for me. He calls you. He guides you. There may be tests and challenges along the way, but he provides for you. He wants to provide for you today and in the days to come. If you will, go on this adventure and follow Jesus. The only thing that is stopping this happening for you and this happening for Bridge Church as we go forward into the future is our lack of faith and trust in God. If we do not step out there, how can he really show his provision for us? So I would encourage you this morning, follow Jesus, follow the call, be guided by him. Seek to overcome the tests in his strength and see the marvellous provisions that God has for all of us. So, guys, let the adventure begin. Thank you, Andy, for your really good talk, wrapping up our adventure series. And thank you, Tom, for your interview. It's really good to hear from you. Sadly, that wraps up our service this morning. It does indeed. But you know where we are. Do follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube to keep up with what is going on. Normally we'd say see you this time next week, same time, same place. But we are not going to be the same time next Sunday. You can have a lie-in because we're actually going to have a later Advent service next Sunday. Woo! I think late afternoon, evening. But do keep an eye on Facebook, Instagram and the website just to make sure you know what time and you don't miss out because we'd love you to join us for our Advent service next Sunday. We've also got a really exciting Christmas programme coming up so make sure you keep your eye out for that too. We certainly do and look it's been so great um, having you with us this morning. We really hope you have a great week whatever it is you're doing and we're looking forward to kicking off our Christmas programme with our Advent service next week. So take care guys and see you next Sunday. Have a good week.